uh, good afternoon all of you and uh, welcome to this uh, touring 100 grand finale so the agenda for the day is like this uh, after this introduction uh, uh, anand will take an overview of uh, touring 100 celebrations at persistent in fact we started this uh, activity uh, july last july and uh, we had done lot of activities around touring 100 so anand will take an overview of that and then we'll have the talk from professor fatak for which we all of us have gathered uh, then after that we have a, a qa session sort of a moderated qa session uh, two of uh, dr fatak's uh, students venki and navin will take his interview we'll also have some questions from the audience also during that time uh we don't have a specific break uh, in between but uh, we'll require some 5 minutes setup time once uh, the talk is over and we start with the interview session actually there are uh, apart from this apart from persistent locations at nagpur goa we have many colleges which are connected to this through webex so i would like to welcome all of them for this particular session so in fact there are uh, cities which i didn't know also so there are some cities Uh, known cities coimbatore vizag and uh, mumbai some cities, some colleges from pune and uh, bhopal nashik aurangabad when there are many colleges uh, which actually i also don't know the names of the cities some from andhra pradesh but one good thing is some college from indore also is joining so <laughs> so we have almost uh, this uh, uh, 30 31 colleges joining on the webex so let me finish here my introduction and invite anand for giving us the overview for the touring hundred celebrations yes um thank you very much shekhar uh, it's okay um and welcome to this uh, event which uh, we we are calling it grand finale of the centenary year but uh, we have actually a plan to continue with this and i'll share with you what we are doing here So as is well known uh, uh, Alan Turing was the father of computer science he was a multifaceted person and uh, uh, there's a lot that came out about him in the last one year or two years since his last year was his centenary year but he was a well known mathematician logician code breaker cryptographer cryptanalyst computer scientist mathematical biologist long distance runner and uh, and of course he is known as the father of computer science and uh, si- he was born in uh, 1912 in june 1912 and uh, last year 2012 was his centenary year and um, on that occasion one of the things that uh, we decided to do it at persistent was to use this opportunity to create some excitement around computer science and other related things and one of the well known things that uh, is so acm which is a very well known society for uh, computer scientists called the association of computing machinery and all those of you who are attending who are not members of acm should become members of acm acm has an annual award uh, called the turing award which is given to uh, the most influential computer scientist in some sense and it is like the equivalent of the nobel prize and for the last 60 to 63 years we have had uh, 62 63 of these touring awards that have been given away one every year and a lot of the work that happens for an award winner when he gets that award is seminal contributions to computer science and algorithms or s- techniques or whatever else and uh, we find that as computer scientists we should be more aware of these and we typically don't know these as well so we thought it would be a good idea to pick one touring award winner for every month invite someone who would spend the time to read the work that a touring award winner has uh, done over the years and create a session around the life and work of one touring award winner every month and when we started this out we were not sure uh, how we would have difficulty you know whether we will be able to find people who would be willing to spend their time to read all these papers in advance and come back but i'm really pleased to say that the response we got was phenomenal so much so that we decided that we should not stop this this year it's a really good activity and we should continue this much beyond this this year and i'm going to share a little bit of that 
uh, what was disappointing to some extent was the audience that we got for these events, okay? So the speakers were phenomenal. We have all of those uh, talks on video on YouTube and they are already published and available. All the lecture material for all these talks is all available. I, I can say that uh, this series has been one of the best quality, um, you know, lectures about in-depth topics in computer science that we have hosted at Persistent. You know, doing this consistently for 12, for 12 months has been a really uh, good achievement that I'm really proud of. Um, so, you know, again, we used uh, Alan Turing as a way for uh, the fact that his contribution was well known. It was a centenary year. There was a lot of buzz about this. We use this as an occasion to get this activity going. And we typically conducted these uh, lecture series on a Saturday afternoon, typically at two o'clock. And uh, we used our website to get registrations up front and all that. And all the lectures, as I said, are already available online uh, on YouTube and presentations are also available. So please feel free to look at them. They have, uh, most of the speakers did an excellent job of summarizing the highlights of a person's work, life work, in a matter of an hour or 15 minutes. And since these sessions typically were about three hours, after every session, we had another uh, sort of auxiliary session along with that session, typically either a panel discussion or uh, something that uh, was relevant to bring these theoretical or other concepts back to real life. So, uh, as I said, we first started out by doing a session on July 7, 2012, where we had uh, Professor Mathai Joseph, who has uh, been studying uh, some of the work that uh, Alan Turing has done. He actually did a talk on Alan Turing. And then we have a colleague in our team uh, who actually spent some, who has written a book about uh, some of the work that Turing had done. And he also did a short session after that. Um, on August 4th, we had the privilege of having Professor Sham Nawate, who is a well-known database researcher uh, from Georgia Tech University. He was here and since he had worked in relational databases, we had him talk about E.F. Cord, who is the father of databases and he is the one who got the 1981 Turing Award. Um, in September, we had Venki, who is our CTO talk about wind surf and Bob Kahn for their pioneering work on internet. These, are, these gentlemen are known to be the father of the internet. So we started with the father of computer science, the father of databases, now we had the father of internet here in some sense. Surf and Kahn have done phenomenal work in the TCP IP and other communication protocols. And they were the winners for, or they were the awardees for the 2004 uh, Alan Turing Award. Um, Naveen, who is uh, moderating today's session, did an excellent session on Robin Milner, uh, who has done a lot of work on uh, um, functional programming and ML and various other things like that. And actually, after that session, we had a very in engaging panel discussion about uh, functional programming and does functional programming make sense to be taught in colleges? And does it make sense to do functional programming as a programming paradigm for commercial and business applications. And we had a couple of faculty members who had been teaching functional programming or have taught it in the past and have not taught it, who commented on what the benefits of learning functional programming are. And we had some professionals who were actually deploying functional programming in Pune in, in commercial and business situations. So it was a very good interactive session that we had on October 6th. and. Uh, Naveen was uh, doing that. Then we had uh, a session on November 24th uh, by Niran Karnik, who also is here today. Uh, he talked about the work from Butler Lamson in the operating systems area in general. So Butler Lamson was the Turing Award winner for 1992. Okay, and 5th of January, I, had, I, I gave a talk about the work done by Jim Gray. Uh, Jim Gray, again, has done a lot of work in various areas and a very interesting personality and uh, uh, his contribution to transaction processing are very well known. But beyond transactions as well, he had worked on uh, very uh, good work around scientific computing and databases and how uh, science is changing because the collection of data and some very interesting work. And 
having done this once, I really felt, um, I knew I was going to talk about Jim Gray for almost four months. And for nearly four months, this was an activity that I had, I was chewing in my brain for a while. And it was really a very good experience for me to look at uh, papers and work that Jim Gray had done. And it really helped me refresh some of the ideas that I had read many, many years back and had never touched for many years. So this was a really good experience for those of you who are thinking whether they should be doing this. I can tell you from personal experience that this was a really good experience for me. And I would encourage you to you know, pick one Turing Award winner and really look at the work that they did. Uh, we had Abhijit, who is also here today, talk about John Bacchus, who again is very influential in terms of his work that he did in the early days of computing. He was the one who pretty much uh, created Fortran, and Fortran was the number one programming language in the computing days in the early years. And uh, even now, there are many people who still use Fortran for scientific computing work. And some of his other work around FP was also fairly well known. So really, you know, uh, pioneer in some sense in our field, who won the 1977 uh, Turing Award. That was February. In March, uh, we had uh, Mukun, who, who's here today as well, talk about Judea Pearl and his work around probabilistic and causal reasoning. A relatively hard topic to uh, understand. Papers are pretty difficult to read. But Mukun did a really good job of uh, making it uh, much simpler in terms of explaining uh, what the issues are in this particular research work. And, uh, you know, I, I thought it was a very uh, good topic for people who had no idea what these kind of things were to get an understanding of the complexity of the problem and how uh, Judea Pearl ap approached that problem. So he was the 2011 uh, Turing Award winner. Uh, on uh, April 13th, uh, we had Atul Narkhede talk about Ivan S Sutherland on his work around computer graphics. And he was one of the first ones to um, do computer graphics on the on, on an old machine in some sense. So first kind of screen interactions of sort. And then, uh, you know, of course, he did a lot of other things beyond that. But Atul gave a pretty good overview of some of the early work done by Ivan Sutherland. Uh, on May 11th, uh, we had Pandurang Kamath talk about uh, Rivesh Shamir and Adelman and their work around public tree crypt cryptography and security related issues. Again, they, they were the 2002 uh, Turing Award winner. So uh, excellent uh, overview there from Pandurang on this one. And then uh, we, this was in May and this is the June event that we are doing today. And of course, we have the pleasure of uh, having Professor Fadak here, but I'm going to introduce him a little later. Uh, as I said, we decided that uh, we should not stop this good, good thing just because we are done with one year and the fact that we cannot call it a centenary year for three years. So we will just call it Turing Tech Talks now, okay? But I think we will continue this theme of having, so we may not call it the Turing 100, even though the alias may remain, <laughs> I don't know, but uh, we will, Continue the series in the Turing, maybe we could still call it Turing 100 also, I don't know. We still have Suvarna Jayanti trains and all kinds of things like that. So maybe it's still okay to call it that. But there is no reason to stop this activity just because we have completed 12 uh, uh, months on this one. So we will continue with this and we are still looking for volunteers who might want to uh, talk about one of the Turing Award winners. And the idea was that, you know, we have about 60 plus Turing Award winners so far. So technically this should go on for almost five years, but we can give the choice to the speaker. So the next one should be a pretty interesting one. That should be, I think, towards the last week, I think 29th of July, right? 27th of July, Saturday. And on 27th July, Saturday, we are going to have Vijay Raman uh, talk about the work from Thompson and Ritchie around the Unix operating system. Again, they were, uh, they have really changed operating system and how most of you who have gone to college, I'm sure, would have learned Unix and talked about Unix and how Unix was built. So um, Vijay has definitely worked in this area for a long time and he uh, will give us an overview of the life and work of Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie, uh, who were the chief guys at AT&T who designed the Unix operating system. And like that day, we will also have another session where we are trying to find someone who might talk about 
how the operating system has moved from Unix to perhaps getting it down to a cell phone. So, and a cell phone operating system, how, how are those issues lived it or what has changed when you relook at these things 30 years later. See, it's very interesting to look at sometimes these historical things for the following reason that, you know, when people um, in the 1980s or 70s did some of this phenomenal work, they were looking at hardware and computers of a particular kind, meaning the disk would have been, uh, you know, several uh, hundred kilos and things like that. Today, a terabyte is something you carry for hundred dollars in your pocket and five terabytes in your pocket is not such a big thing or the CPU power that we were looking at at that time and you compare that with a cell phone. So a lot of these algorithms that were done during that time, uh, you have to consider them in the context of the computing equipment of that time. But you know, very interestingly, while that is all true, when you look at these algorithms and look at the work that these people have done, a lot of that work still holds good even today. And this I could say from the work I looked at Jim Gray, he had a five minute rule about how you should look at what should be kept in disk versus main memory. And you, he wrote this five minute paper in early, late eighties in the context of the hardware at that time. But today there are enough, every five to 10 years, someone has gone ahead and updated the parameters. But this whole concept that you know, you have a hierarchy of memory and you want to keep something close to you versus keeping it far away. The basic concepts have not changed. Transaction processing still continues to be very important. So the fact that over 30, 40, 50 years, some of the work that has been done in the past is coming back again and again in different contexts makes it important for us to not ignore this work, but to relook at it and look at it in the context that it was designed so that we can consider if, if we had to do this again now, what would be the implications of doing this? So I'm really looking forward to Vijay's talk and that should be on the 27th of July. After that, Ajay Deshpande has agreed to talk on Barbara Liskov's work. She did a lot of work around object progr object oriented programming and uh, sev several of her abstractions in programming languages are very widely used. So she was the 2008 um, Turing Award uh, winner and uh, she visited India in 2009 uh, for one of the ACM events and uh, she's from MIT. Uh, Hemant Pandey, who has actually met Fran and worked with her in the past, and he's going to talk ab about the work done by Fran Allen. Uh, she was the 2006 Turing Award winner. And again, we have two ladies, one after the other, which is a good thing. There aren't that many women who got Turing Awards. Um, so that's what we are announcing right now. We also have a few more people who have volunteered to do this, but I'd really like to see this activity continue uh, beyond just the, uh, you know, 15 or 18, we need to go through it for the rest of the year as well. So looking forward to some feedback and suggestions from you on how we can do it. Uh, irrespective of whether we are able to do this talk or not, ACM has done a very good job last year of creating this website called the amtouring.acm.org site, which is the Allen Turing Award site. It lists all the award winners and all the work done by them. So the papers, uh, the, see what happens is that people who get a Turing Award typically give a Turing Award lecture after they win the award. And in that award, it's not that they publish the same papers, they produce something new that is related to the work that they may have done. And all these Turing Award winning lectures have been actually a phenomenal contribution in itself, you know, that itself could have been a Turing Award winner doing some, you know, good work about explaining what they have done. All these papers and in some of the newer cases, the videos of Turing Award week speakers, meaning the lecture that Turing Award winner gave for his award, those lecture videos are also available on this site. And this is available for free actually. So you don't even have to be a member of ACM to get access to this one. But despite this, I still recommend that you become a member of the ACM. Uh, it costs only 1000 rupees to become a member of the ACM. And it's really shameful, we are proud, well, you know, we have about 6,000 members. It's about 3,000 professional members and 3,000 uh, student members. So for a community of 2 million programmers, that's a really, in my opinion, a very shameful number. Okay, so in addition to this, we did a programming competition around this event, which was called 
semicolons. This was set up in an IPL style uh, where we had uh, teams doing a 24 hour uh, programming competition where each team contributed some money for charity and the winners. Uh, we distributed three, four winners winning charity teams. The charities that they were supporting, they got 7 lakh uh, rupees and all total was distributed. This was collected by um, teams that participated through an auction and then the Persistent Foundation matched the donation that was made possible by the teams. Uh, we ran a very uh, nice internal uh, showcase called I Share under this during the year. It was called I Tried but Did Not Work was a pretty interesting concept that we ran. And there was this was a mostly persistent internal thing. Uh, we debated quite some time to see whether Alan Turing was a marathon runner and then if it made sense for us to have a marathon. <laughs> Most of us decided that that was beyond our <laughs> capabilities. <laughs> so we just had a 5K walk run on December 16th that uh, many enthusiastic people participated. It was more a uh, get together rather than a real serious run, but I thought it was a good event to, to remember that, you know, Turing was a marathon runner. Uh, this was actually a very popular institute that we had where, uh, sorry, popular quiz that we had, which was CSI and Rally Score participated in this 304 teams, 162 colleges. This was done with CSI. Uh, there was a quiz called Turing quiz, where Turing was broadly, not just Turing, but Turing and Turing related things and Turing award winners and everything else was part of this quiz. And the finals were organized at the SV Institute in Ahmedabad. Uh, we did another Turing quiz as part of this internally at Persistent, which was again there. And uh, we've been using this website for people to get this thing going and uh, that's what it is. Uh, this is the final plug on this one. Now let, him, let me come to today's speaker. And you know, one of the things, reason why it sort of took a little longer today was when we started this session today, we were worried that we didn't have enough of people in the hall. So then, now at least I see enough of you here, so that's good. <laughs> so, you know, I have heard Professor Fatak many times, and I can tell you that this is a talk you should never miss, okay? So it's always a pleasure to have you here, sir. And uh, Professor Fatak is my guru, okay? And uh, I have known him now. I did not go to IIT Bombay, so he never taught me any course from in, in any way, but I have known him since uh, early 90s and every step that I have taken at Persistent, I have always um, chatted with him and talked to him before I do anything important. And he is always a, a source of inspiration for me in terms of what he, um, the kind of advice that he has given me. So it's always a pleasure to have him here. He is of course, uh, for many of you in Pune, he is fairly well known, but so those of you who are from outside, I'd like to mention that Professor Fatak is, the, is a professor in computer science at IIT Bombay. He did his PhD from there and is a native, I wouldn't say native, he did his engineering from Indore. He has lived in all parts of Madhya Pradesh. And uh, he uh, got the Padma Shri award last year and uh, it's my pleasure to invite you, sir. So I present to you uh, our speaker for the day, Pradmashri Professor D.B. Fatak. Thank you, sir. Can you hear me? Yes. So good afternoon. I begin with many thanks to the organizers. Actually, there is a little story when Anand conceptualized this idea. <coughs> he asked me whether I would like to speak on any one of the uh, Turing Award winners. And uh, I found that would be very hard work because you have to first understand what that person did and then and try to explain it. So I said I would rather speak on a general topic of interest. Unfortunately, I realized after the topic was fixed that it took far more work to prepare for this talk. I would have rather learned through the research papers of the Turing Award winners. That would have been a simpler thing. 
But I must thank uh, Anand Venki and Mr. Sasrabuddha for coming up with a title which I believe is important, is relevant, and is, of course, very close to my heart. Rethinking education, transforming and scaling the learning models. Well, that is what a teacher does all along, hopefully. But in the process of preparing for this talk, I, I learned a lot more about learning than I had ever known. Now, this is amazing how uh, learning itself is so complex an issue and uh, so interesting an issue. By the way, uh, before I forget, I greeted the audience here, but I understand that there are friends from some 30 or colleges. And I was sitting uh, down and I was watching the screen. This one screen, uh, I was told it's uh, the uh, Nagpur thing. I have a suspicion that the person sitting in front is a person very well known to me. Is that uh, Professor Narain Chaudhary by any chance? If he is hearing me, can he raise his hand? Oh yeah, he is there. Oh, wonderful. Well, for those of you who do not know him, he was a brilliant student at IIT. I had the privilege of being his guide in his MTech and PhD. And he has been a professor at various places at Indore and uh, Singapore. And he has just two days ago taken over as director of ENIT, an institution which perpetually sends good students to us. So thank you, Naren, for coming over. So let me come back to this topic then. Rethinking education, transforming and scaling the learning models. <coughs> I'm going to touch upon five points, three of which are embedded in the title. The first one, I'll speak about learning, which as I said, I learned a lot more about learning in recent past, so I'll share something with you. And of course, some of my own thoughts. The second is education itself. Most of us are familiar with the established conventional systems of education. Uh, I will of course comment on them, whether they are adequate, inadequate, and what they ought to do, etc. And the third, is about scaling because that is what is absolutely essential for a nation of our size and the population of our size. The fourth and fifth issues that I will be touching upon will deal with open sourcing of knowledge and of technology imperatives that have emerged and that will continue to emerge. Open sourcing is important in my uh, feeling in more than one ways. But it's not very easy to handle open sourcing of knowledge in a generic sense. So I'll comment on uh, how it ought to proceed further and how it is important and relevant for the topic at hand. Technology is something most of you are familiar with, but I will do some crystal grazing. And I'll try to suggest what are likely to be the technologies which pertinent to education and learning, of course, which are likely to become center stage in coming decades. Of course, it's extremely difficult to predict anything in technology these days, but I will, I will try my bit. So after talking about these five things, in my concluding part, I would like to suggest a roadmap on what India must do. And in that again, I will talk to five different entities. The first is universities and government. The second is teachers. The third is professionals. The fourth is parents. And last but not the least, the students, the majority of learners. So I call it a five plus five breakup of the lecture. Let me begin with learning. All of us are familiar with learning in a group environment. So when we attend lectures, we attend lectures to learn. When we solve problems, we solve problems to learn. When we discuss, we learn, etc., etc. Let us look at a typical classroom lecture learning. Okay. 
All of you are familiar with the process of classes arranged for 40 minutes, 50 minutes or one hour, 55 minutes, whatever. That is the typical duration. Incidentally, while preparing for this lecture, I tried to find out the root cause of defining the duration of a lecture as 45 minutes or 50 minutes or one hour. It's unbelievable. There is no historical record of how it came about. Okay. So I'm just guessing that it was probably a compromise between a appropriate time duration for an individual to concentrate on a lecture, which is consistently being proven as about 15 minutes, to the requirement of avoiding mass scale movement every 15 minutes of large number of students from one classroom to another classroom. So some American systems, for example, they have a one teacher who teaches from morning till evening, eight hours, no movement, zero movement. Of course, probably zero knowledge at the end, but that's a different story. If you analyze the, the, the learning that happens in a classroom, you have to analyze it from the perspective of each individual participant in the classroom. So let's assume there are 50 students and one teacher giving a lecture. Let's analyze how learning happens here. The teacher, of course, has prepared, hopefully, for that lecture, prepared points succinctly, organized his thoughts, etc., etc., and starts speaking. Presumably, 60 pairs of eyes and ears are uh, seeing the teacher and listening to the teacher. Does this happen consistently for the entire period of one hour or 40 minutes or something? That is nonsense. All of us know that. I would recall the classes that I attended, for example, there would be occasions when people would see through the windows outside, particularly if there are, uh, there is a nice greenery in a, in a monsoon season, or uh, for a college student, there are other green things to see, for example. So all those interesting things you will see here and there. Maybe that is one of the reasons why auditoriums are built without windows, so you can't see outside, you can just see in front. Look at listening. I am sitting at one particular position and the teacher is speaking. Ostensibly, I am listening to whatever the teacher says. Suddenly, two students, two rows to the right and behind me, start murmuring about something. Maybe about Shah Rukh Khan movie or something like that. Believe me, I can hear their murmur more clearly than what the teacher is speaking from the distance. That is the ability of the human brain to shift focus immediately. Look at the vision. I am ostensibly looking at the teacher. That's how I keep the teacher happy. But am I actually looking at his face and body language? I am often looking at him, generically. In fact, many times I am looking through him. <laughs> so there is no guarantee. See, that is why I, I digress a bit. But when we talked about the technology first, you know, virtual classroom, which is something we have done, I will explain it later. But effectively, like for example, the... Uh, the uh, video that is being carried of this session to other places and the audio that is being carried to the other session. What this technology does not take into account that the recipients are actually, if there are 60 students, there are 60 pairs of cameras and 60 pairs of listening devices. And each one is controlled independently by an obstinate brain which decides what to listen, what to see. Can we ever create that effect? And that's the reason why uh, participation in a live lecture and trying to use technology in such a way that the lecture is made as live as possible, including the windows we show outside greenery, is very, very important for the psychology of group learning. Does learning happen in a classroom, perhaps partially? Learning, to my mind, occurs maximally when you try to apply whatever you have heard or whatever you have studied. So reading from the books apparently is supposed to provide a lot of learning. And it is in this context that access to knowledge is considered extremely important. In fact, again I digress, but in the modern days, the creators of e-learning material 
and the vocal uh, supporters of everything that is e dash something claim that students can learn anything and everything on their own using all the available tools and uh, contents and so on sadly it's very obviously untrue if access to good quality knowledge was equal to learning then the librarians would have been the most learned people on the face of earth <laughs> because they have maximum access in a traditional thing there is no evidence of that of course librarians are good people they are quite well educated and learned but they are not the most learned although they have the maximum access to the maximum amount of knowledge around them. so access to knowledge is significantly different from assimilation of that knowledge through reading contemplating thinking discussing applying failing to apply successfully and then learn now these are the steps through which learning occurs and any system which that does not provide for all of these steps in a conducive manner would fail to permit people to learn in spite of whatever i have said the educational system that we see today the established educational system is by far the best that humanity has been able to achieve in order to promote learning amongst people without that system learning would be far more difficult there are of course possibilities of individuals will learn again without denigrating the e learning technologies and other things what i said some time ago is true that mere access to knowledge is not does not amount to learning but the exact opposite is also true if there is no access to knowledge at all learning cannot happen easily and therefore access to knowledge is equally important but if we think that an individual can learn entirely on one's own there are cases where people study on their own when the environment is not conducive when there are no good teachers when there are no good books and eklavya is often cited as the best example after all in our mythological story he actually discovered and invented the entire art of archery on one's own having been denied good education by the most profound teacher of that time but we should not forget that in the entire history of india and possibly of the world there is only one eklavya and there are 7 billion human beings in this world each one of them needs to learn as much as is possible for them and as is necessary for them it is in this context that we must always remember the purpose of learning why does a human being learn so for the moment forget the conventional education systems can forget everything just consider a primitive human society where the established educational systems don't exist and yet uh, a human child has to learn just like any young of the species or animal species has to learn okay the learning is primarily for survival that is the first and primary motive and the second motive which is more predominant amongst the human species being more intelligent than others is for betterment of one's life that is the objective of learning if you look at it from an individual's point of view i wish to learn something because a i wish to survive and i believe that by learning something i make myself better as a survivor two i want to make my life better which in the conventional sense means i want to become rich which again in conventional sense means i want to get a good job i want to build a good career these are the main objectives of learning there are two other important objectives but practiced maybe intrinsically by all humans but explicitly by very few of us one is learning for the sake of learning okay that happens because every human being is curious because it is the curiosity which propels the human to learn and therefore quite often learning happens for the sake of learning although that particular learning may not be very very effective or useful in the conventional sense 
for betterment of one's life or a career or something like that. So learning of that kind can also happen. The second kind of learning that happens is learning to advance the human knowledge, which is what we term as research. Sadly, research and education have been separated out by modern human society to extremely hazardous results because research, in my opinion, represents a mindset. It's not just about writing a thesis and publishing papers, but it's a mindset which should be the ultimate in variety of aspects of human endeavor in learning, which is a perfection of those aspects. So, for example, meticulousness, for example, tremendous curiosity, for example, perfect articulation of idea, for example, diligence, for example, discipline and rigor. I often give this example to some of you might have heard it. All of us are familiar with simple mathematical formulations. And if we wish to say that we want to consider three variables A, B and C, which are not equal to each other, we often say A not equal to B not equal to C. I used to do that many years till I found out the correct representation. A not equal to B not equal to C not equal to A. Because the first one does not imply that A and C are unequal. That is rigor. Now that rigor comes out of the mindset which looks for that rigor and perfecting that mindset is actually highest end of research in PA. But should we not expect that kind of rigor, that kind of perfection in articulation, that kind of ability to, to uh, logically put your ideas forward, to logically analyze things, don't we expect all of that in every human being, in every child who goes through the education and therefore research and education have to be complementary, they have to be two sides of the same coin. Of course, we have to separate out what we might call the true advancement in human knowledge as a, as a kind of research. But research mindset and the research approach is important in every learning process. In fact, when a young child is learning the mother tongue, which is the most difficult part by the way, okay, the child does it through research, through experimentation, and through articulation, and through correction. Okay. Curiously, this is what I have found. I said that this preparation was, was very hard for me because I studied a lot and I learned a lot about learning. I was under the impression that maximum amount of learning happens in the conventional educational process and subsequently it happens in the one's professional life. I was so surprised and shocked to find out that actually the most important learning happens before the child even goes to the school. Between the age of zero and five years. And that is the age when the brain itself is getting fully prepared. You remember the development of brain actually contains, uh, continues up to the age of five. That is also the duration in which the child learns the most difficult thing. It learns the first foreign language in its life which is a hard problem for majority of grown-ups. It is during that time when the child learns to understand and interpret the behavior of all others and decides on what is the best behavior to get things one's own way. This is a hard learning. So, social behavior, okay, basic articulation concepts, Basic interpretation of visualization, basic coordination, all of this is learned during those first five years. That is also the time when fundamental values are seeded into the child's mind. What is good behavior? Okay, behaving with, well with elders, saying please, saying sorry, sharing things, ethics. You know, ethics and humility are uncommon natively to any human. They are derived values out of culture. And these values are implanted at least in the seed forms in the first five years. Why I say this is, I was, I was quite, in fact, I was briefly aware of what learning happens there. The extreme, of course, being Abhimanyu who learned how to break chakra view even before he was physically born. So I should say minus nine months to five years is the correct span of learning. What?
Why I mention all of this is, please understand that the subsequent learning that happens beyond five years through our educational processes must match in quality and content much more than what the child has already learned. And that is our joint responsibility as a society. I am afraid that while we do a lot and quantitatively children learn a lot, but I am not so sure whether qualitatively we add significantly to the fundamental values and fundamental learnings that the child has already done at the age of five years. That is something that should make us sit up and perhaps have a real look at. Let us talk about education. So, here is a wiki. By the way, Wikipedia, in my opinion, has emerged as the best consolidated reference site for a majority of useful knowledge. I, I say this with, with, a, with a lot of search and research because very succinct, very much to the point, generally accurate and fairly comprehensive information is available in Wikipedia. I wish when I met the creator of the Wikipedia on two occasions, I should have realized the great contribution he's making. It's much beyond a dictionary. I mean, it is not started like a dictionary, but it's much beyond that. It's amazing stuff and someday maybe most of the educational system would do well to formally have Wikipedia as a reference text. In any case, most of the plagiarism done by students while submitting their seminar reports, etc., etc., happens from Wikipedia. <laughs> so, the education is defined in Wikipedia in the following form. It's a form of learning in which the knowledge, skills, and habits of a group of people are transformed from one generation to the next through teaching, training, or research. And it further says, any experience that has a formative effect on the way one thinks, feels, or acts may be considered educational. I like the last line because I have personally held always that every human interaction teaches me something. I have found that to be always true, whether it's a two-minute interaction or half an hour interaction or one hour interaction with any one human being or groups, I have always ended up carrying back something extra, something positive for me to churn about. There is learning in, in every human interaction. And contrary to what we may not suspect this, but each one of us, when we deal with people, when we interact with people, whether it is through formal lectures, labs, etc., or informally, there is a learning that happens. So consequently, educational processes are always active. And this is something that we should appreciate. It is not just only when one person is actually operating within the conventional education system that uh, education is happening and elsewhere it is not. It's not like that. Every moment of your life, educational impact is happening. And it is that overall impact that needs to be made extraordinarily beneficial. So now, Having talked enough about the first point that is learning, let me spend some time on the second point that is about education and that is about conventional education. I will not go through the ills of the established education system. Practically each one of us are aware of it. Okay. All of you know how the system is broke, the system uh, you know, creates uh, students who learn by rote, students who cannot apply their mind. Whether it's school education, people say a uh, 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 seventh standard student cannot read the fifth standard textbooks and cannot write correctly what the second standard student is expected to write. It's about school children. Engineering colleges, the industry says hardly 25% of the engineers passing out of our colleges are employable. One may find relative solace in the fact that in the Chinese engineering colleges, the number is still less. But that is neither here nor there. So, we all know how the system is broke and we all want the system to be fixed, but we don't know how to fix the system. 
I have spent quite some time in my early years to try and see whether system can be fixed. And I came to the conclusion only after listening to Sugato Mitra. I don't know how many of you have heard him. He is the person who did the hole in the wall experiment where he says you let technology be exposed to the students and leave the children to do whatever they want to do and they will do amazing things they will learn on their own. That was his main experiment. Recently in a TED award winning lecture he was talking about the established university system and established educational system. And he had a very curious observation. He says, people say the system is broke, the system is broke. He said, what nonsense? The system is not broke at all. The system is extremely solid. In fact, that is the problem. It refuses to break. You cannot change it because it is so solidly enshrined that nothing can be done to change it. It is that observation which made me think. I believe like many of you do that there have to be significant changes which must be made in the established conventional education system. Most of us do not know how to bring about those changes. But please believe Sugato when he says the system is not broke. The system is entrenched very solidly and therefore it will take much more, it will, it will be much harder to change that system. I have personally initiated dialogues, at least in the higher education, with uh, Professor Ved Prakash, the chairman of University Grants Commission, and Dr. Mantha, a good friend of mine, uh, who is the chairman of All India Council of Technical Education, to see what we can do. I'll allude to some of the possible changes that might happen, particularly with respect to the engineering education, which is, of course, uh, my, uh, my major point of operation. Just to recapitulate a few ills of the education system which are well known. A, the teaching is syllabus driven and the learning by students is examination driven. These are the two fundamental facts. I am required to teach as per syllabus because in my university, although I teach, my students will be evaluated by a person who will examine the papers set by a third person. So when I have no control over evaluation and it is the evaluation which will lead to marks and which eventually will lead to a degree, the students are primarily interested in that and therefore I have to teach as per syllabus. The students exactly in the same manner are very clear when they come to, when they come and join a college, their primary ambition is not to advance human knowledge. Their primary ambition is not to learn for the sake of learning, but their primary ambition is what every human ambition is. Learn to make your own life better. They have concluded as a society that if you get a good degree and good marks, your life will be better. Therefore, their ambition is concentrated in a single point aspect, getting a good degree and getting good marks. People talk about cheating and, uh, and you know, uh, all, all kinds of uh, misuse of means to pass exams and so on. Of course, all of that is bad. This, uh, certain ethical standards have to be retained. But please understand why people do it. People do it because A, they are very focused on what they need to do, get marks and degrees. And B, they are smarter because they think they can optimize. Optimization is minimum effort, maximum gain. So if the minimum effort involves 1000 rupees being paid to someone and getting all questions for tomorrow's paper, uh, then life is easy. A slight digression, uh, in IIT we take extremely care that the papers are not leaked, etc. even for internal examiners. Uh, if you ask them, they know that FATAC's papers are never leaked. It's a proven theory. The actual reason is Fatax papers are never ready five minutes before the examination, so they cannot be made. <laughs> but this system, therefore, puts a tremendous stress on evaluation, assessment leading to marks and degree. And consequently, in the higher education, in the notion of affiliated colleges, I'm not just talking about engineering colleges. You take science colleges, you take arts colleges, you take commerce colleges. The syllabus of economics is decided by the university. There are 500 colleges which teach economics. Okay. 
but the best economic education is not guaranteed because a the teachers are not interested in offering that and b the students are not interested in taking because they are they are focused on on passing in them how do we break the jinx i for a long time felt that the only way you can break this jinx is make the education completely autonomous the autonomy of your teacher of course i come from a system where that autonomy is greatly respected when i teach a course i decide what is the syllabus whatever i teach is the syllabus whatever exam paper i give is the exam paper no questions asked and what a grade i give is the grade the senate accepts it now this is ultimate in autonomy there are a lot many pros and cons people say that teachers will not behave responsibly that is bunkum according to me if you put faith and trust in people people will live up to that trusted faith if you suspect that they will not do a good job they actually not do a good job but this is only my theory not proven anywhere so given the present system then how do we ensure that better teaching learning happens that's a that's a question point so two major issues that emerge out of the present education system a the existing convention system is too well entrenched and strong and therefore completely changing it or demolishing it is not going to be easily possible therefore whatever we need to do we should attempt to do it within the precincts of this conventional framework if possible eventually of course the system may be second we must understand and accept that the students primary objective is to get degrees and good marks and that is what will continue to drive them so those who talk about coaching classes being bad etc etc they are talking through their hat okay coaching classes is a societal need society wants it parents want it students want it and therefore they are coaching classes if they could get exactly what they wanted namely good marks in examination through conventional system coaching classes will not be required so we need to make the system better in this respect let me now talk about scaling the advantage that the nation has is called the great dividend okay demographic divi demographic dividend that the nation has namely a very very large percentage of people in our nation are young the median age is 25 that means half the population is younger than 25 years okay well 25 may be too advanced for the learning and education to have been formally over consider the people who are less than 19 years old 300 million now these are extraordinary numbers look at the education system the primary education is being made obligatory we do not know what impact it will have on the actual learning but at least there is an attempt we are one of the poorest countries in terms of expenditure on education india spends very little of its national revenues on education as compared to many other uh, countries which are not advanced countries but that's a different story that is changing slowly look at the enrollment ratios the number of students who pass their schooling and therefore are eligible for higher education is called the gross enrollment ratio percentage of such people who join colleges in most developed countries this ratio ranges from 60 to 80% 60 to 80% who finish their 12th standard exams attend some college of some kind in india that ratio was 8% till about 6 years ago it has been brought to 13 14% now 14 14% and the nation expects to bring that ratio up to 30% by 2020 i request you to remember these numbers and the implications there if we are to increase that gross enrollment ratio it means that the number of colleges and universities that we have in india today have to double in next 7 years double is it possible the only thing that has doubled and quadrupled and multiplied are number of engineering colleges they have increased from about 100 colleges 150 colleges in 1980s to about 4700 all colleges and that was like yesterday evening so i don't know today there might be some more colleges <laughs> the annual capacity of admission to our engineering colleges is about 1.49 million students 
of which 1.25 million students actually take admission. These are the numbers of last year and this year. Uh, last two years, I would say. What it means is that while the number of colleges are increasing, the number of students seeking admission to engineering program has plateaued. Because the students and their parents have understood that going to any college and getting some degree is not going to land you up with a job. So you might as well want to do something else. This is happening now, which is okay. But still, now can you imagine the scale? Where are the teachers? Unlike in most engineering institutions across the developed world, where a faculty member is a PhD holder. Forget the dichotomy between research and uh, conventional education, etc. So the PhD does represent so many extra years of time spent in learning and honing up one thing. Okay. How many PhD holders in engineering colleges in India? You will be surprised that there are certain departments, particularly the more favorite disciplines such as IT, electronics and computer science, where the entire department does not have a single PhD holder as faculty. Nothing great about PhD, by the way. There are, there are great teachers who can be just freshers. In fact, when I was in Indore, uh, one of my most favorite teachers was Tapan Mukherjee, who had just passed from the same institute one year before me. Of course, those days, only the toppers of the college were permitted to join us, uh, you know, teaching assistants or something. Whereas today, the toppers are not available to teach. The industry has gobbled them up. So, Anand is responsible. <laughs> you are eating up all my good teachers. Now, if this is the problem about engineering colleges, please appreciate that the problem is multifold as you go down. Take higher education. If we believe that science colleges, arts colleges and commerce colleges do not have these kind of problems, we are sadly mistaken. Recently, I had a chance to analyze the situation there. Okay. There again, the problem is same. The number of teachers who are required with adequate experience and expertise are not available. Come down to school teachers. I had the privilege uh, last year of joining a pilot project on school education using modern ICT, using Akash and so on. Dr. Kakorkar uh, suggested that we should participate. And we have gone to four schools in Pandharpur. We'll be going to one school in uh, Kokan, in a place called Velneshwar. And we'll be going to one school in Bhikangao in Madhya Pradesh, where we are trying to teach uh, maths and science in Hindi and Marathi, respectively, to students of these places. Pandarpur is a big town, but these four schools are actually outside Pandarpur. They are small schools, they are Marathi schools. I had an interaction with the teachers. We recently called those teachers to find out what kind of exam papers they give and what kind of teaching that they do. It was unbelievable. The kind of emphasis on teaching scientific concepts was much lower in its intensity and quality than what you would expect a ninth standard student to learn. And the teachers explained clearly when we pointed out that, look, your textbook itself says these, these, these things and these are the problems that are given in the textbook. So he told me, uh, sir, uh, our students from villages cannot solve these problems. So we routinely omit problems 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th onward. First, two, 1, 2, 3, 4. And the problems are also very well arranged, extremely simple, then slightly simple, then slightly less simple, and then maybe a few problems which are difficult. So you are not challenging the human minds. And we cannot hold teachers responsible for it. Because the ninth standard teacher says that the student that I get has not studied properly in the eighth standard and goes back all the way down. First time. Who is responsible? We don't know. Uh, some of you might have read a book called Escola Barbiana. It's a very old book. It was written by a few dropout students from, a, from some schools in Italy. It won actually the best award for statistical analysis. It's a Marathi translation, beautiful translation. It was titled Priya Bais, where the, these Italian students say that you keep throwing us out of the schools by failing us and so on. But what are you doing for our education? The problems are not dissimilar here in India. So my dear friend, 
Second point about education, while the conventional systems have been built to provide good education and they are trying to do whatever they can do within their own rules. Unfortunately, their rules and procedures have become so watertight that they exclude the main thing which is education. Assessment is done, degree giving is done, lectures are held, labs are conducted, colleges, uh, attendance is taken, everything is done. We are not very sure whether the education happens there. We need to fix that part. If you consider the educational problems in this scale that is required, can we achieve this scale? How many teachers we would require? How many new physical buildings we will require to house just the labs in engineering colleges and science colleges? Remember, total number of colleges and universities that we have, in next seven years, we require twice as many minimum. And if we do that, the enrollment will go to 30% of the people who pass the study. <coughs> what should be our ambition? 80%. Because that is where the, the society will be a learned society. So we have a long way to go. I remember an extremely beautiful exposition to basic economics given in Persistent itself in a lecture given by uh, Naushat Forbes, I think, uh, uh, Dr. Anand Patwath and Anand, to the school children. And he was talking about, you know, the uh, GDP growth rate. And we were all very excited at that time, including an old one like me, that our growth rate was 8%, 9%, 10%. And he explained that if you look at the per capita income, ours is amongst the lowest. And even if we continue to grow at extraordinary pace in terms of the normal GDP growth, even at 10%, 11%, 9%, to catch up with the per capita income of Malaysia itself will take 15 more years. That, friends, is the impact of scale. If we want to achieve that scale, then it is extremely difficult to do that. And whatever efforts you do, including gigantic efforts, the challenges are still larger in front of us. So let me wrap up on these three things. First thing about learning. Learning happens because of a variety of processes, but it is largely decided by a learner as to what he or she wants to learn. Education provides a system in which Teaching is supposed to happen, which is supposed to permit learner to learn. Uh, this is very curious. Every time I ask teachers, because I give a lot of talks to teachers, I have been working on teachers training for the last several years, and this is my favorite question. So all of you are teachers? Yes. So you all believe that our main job is to teach? Yes. And I said, no, that is wrong. It is because many of us wrongly believe that our main job is to teach, that we forget the main job. Main job is to enable the student to learn. And there is a subtle but very important difference between the two. When I say I am a teacher and I teach, I presume that whatever I give is useful knowledge and whatever I give is acquired by the student unadulterated. That does not happen. But if I say my duty is to actually enable every student to learn best, then I see the whole thing from the learner's perspective. So you see, we talk of teacher-centric and student-centric. I mean, I sometimes get baffled by terminology. The more learned of the human beings are so good at obfuscating issues by giving terminology and abbreviations and so on, that some basic themes are easily lost. What I conclude is that a teacher has as primary job is to ensure that each and every individual in the group that is allocated to the teacher is able to learn in the best possible manner for that individual. Learning will not be identically possible for all people. And this is one part which is why I said these, let me comment a few things on the combination of learning, education and scaling. The classes are becoming larger because of the scaling. There were 20 students and 30 students, 40, 50, 60, 80. As I said, we can't scale because we can't have so many good teachers. Forget good teachers, we can't have teachers. <coughs> Education and learning, as I just mentioned. Now, if in this process, 
if i have to enable every student to learn best i must first admit the fact that all students will not learn to the same extent unfortunately there is another problem with the current education system the current education system provides fixed time for learning but permits variable amount of learning school education 12 years first to 12th standard engineering college 4 years it is assumed that every student who attends an engineering college will learn exactly the same amount of engineering in 4 years that is nonsense no two human beings can have the same amount of learning in the same fixed time depends on variety of things aptitude attitude motivation okay environment so many things okay as i said in a single class the number of people who benefit from that lecture differs widely if i spend most of the time looking at the greenery or looking through the teacher i will learn the less if some student is very attentive making notes will learn the most this happens within a one hour now you look at the consistency of these approaches over the semester it is very obviously that some students will learn more some students will learn less what is the education system's response to this fact we evaluate and grade the students 90 percent are 60 percent are 40 percent are 30 percent what do we achieve we provide an extremely useful filter to the society and industry but worse we denigrate people who get lower marks once i am designated to be a 30 percenter forget others my own friends my own family starts looking down at me are dumbo aise kuch hone wala nahi fail ho gaya and i will start believing in it and i will lose enormously in my self esteem should i not say that look maybe i am a slow learner but i am capable being a human being i am capable of learning everything give me more time let me learn at my own pace permit me to learn this for 5 years permit me to learn a course not over 3 months but over 7 months look at me understand my abilities understand my motivations and provide an individual learning landscape for me alone it's not possible in the current scales and that is where the last point that i'll talk about namely technology becomes very vital for the first time humanity has got a chance to do something like this instead of fixed time and variable learning we can now insist on minimum learning with variable time we must of course understand that the variable time cannot be infinite i mean i cannot come and say that look i am a human being so therefore i am reasonably smart but i am very lazy i don't like to learn so please permit me to do this one subject in 10 years i will slowly learn everything this is not useful because in 10 years i am expected to do much more because my total life span is 100 years so variable timing with a judicious limits on minimum and maximum is a possibility now which was never a possibility the conventional education system has not considered this possibility at all it was not not at all conceivable that anything can be done now it is possible to do so so this is these are some of my thoughts on on uh, learning education and scaling and now it is in this context that i speak about the open sourcing of knowledge and the technology crystal gazing first and foremost i have been a great what should i say uh, supporter of open sourcing all kinds of knowledge but i am also fully aware of the requirement of the real human society to convert some of the generated knowledges into financial gains because that is what creates the primary motive for innovation in most of the modern businesses in fact the reasons why patents and copyright laws exist contrary to popular belief they were not created to protect the knowledge for the sake of wealth generation by few but they were created to protect the human knowledge in the long term by ensuring that after certain period of time the knowledge that is so captured and logged into the copyrights and patents is made available to human that is why there is a time period and the industry cleverly keeps pushing at that time period so the 
Patent Act and Copyright Act. Copyright, for example, in United States used to be whatever, seven years or ten years. Then it became lifetime of the author. And then it became 30 years after the author is dead. Nobody inquires that actually the copyright has been purchased by some company. And that company uses the fact that even the author, after the author is dead, for 30 years that copyright remains with me and I can exploit it commercially, etc., etc. But that will continue to happen. After all, the objective of the uh, commercial enterprises is to make money on the innovation that people do. And there is nothing wrong in it. But in this battle, people who wish to dedicate whatever knowledge they have created to open source, they must be permitted to do so easily and effectively. That is where the problem happens. Because if you look at the patents, for example, take software. If I want to open source a certain portion of software which I think I have created, I might have referred to a few algorithms. I have to go back and check whether one of those algorithms is under patent. If it is, then it is not very clear whether I should release it or not. Take, for example, conventional knowledge, books. You see so much knowledge on the web, including Wikipedia. Incidentally, are you aware that much of the knowledge outside Wikipedia is not truly open source? That people who put their tutorials, for example, on the web. We had a case, one tutorial was put up and I think uh, uh, Professor Sudarshan Saman, uh, he made a mirror server so that people could easily access that tutorial and put that tutorial there. And some students were referring to it in one of his courses. And that teacher wrote a very angry letter saying, how can you do that without my permission? So, uh, Sudarshan wrote to him saying, look, it is on the web, so it is downloadable by anybody. I am just merely facilitating people to download it. In fact, that way I am popularizing your material. He says, no, it is my copyright, you require my permission. These are the kind of hassles that the matter was resolved when Shaumain Chakravarti, another colleague of mine, wrote a very nice letter to that professor saying, thank you for all of this. We have determined that your tutorial is not worth reading by anybody anyway, so we are scrapping it. Now, these are the kind of ego problems, but there are also commercial issues which prevent knowledge from going into open source. Fortunately, and, and this knowledge, you see the open source movement started with software, but it has gone far beyond that because software is not the ultimate in knowledge. The knowledge is anywhere else. So look at Creative Commons, for example, and I would, I would strongly suggest that people should use as much as knowledge as possible from Creative Commons and contribute as much to it because that is what would spread. I am not talking in the context of sensitive knowledge which is, you know, part of some important commercial activities. I am talking about common sense knowledge. And let me tell you how poor licensing hinders the way. In our uh, effort for the school education, we wanted to get the books which are used in Marathi, in, in uh, Maharashtra, on Akash tablets, okay? We wanted to actually create interactive lessons with animations, which is now possible with technology, but which is not possible in books. And uh, we, we found out that these books are on the site. NCRT has a site, Balbharti has a site, and on these sites, these books are there. We tried to see what is the license. It says copyright. But it also says you can download freely. Now here is a hitch. I can download it for my own personal use, maybe for my son's use. Can I load it onto Akash tablet and distribute? Actually, the legal answer is no. Firstly, I don't want to do that. What is the point in loading, downloading PDF books and making them available on Akash? Okay, people have printed copies anyway. We actually wanted the digital contents which we could reshape in the form of HTML files in which using HTML5 we could actually build interaction, activity, interesting animations, interesting simulations. This is the objective. Okay. But that material is not easily available. We wrote to several people and we are still not clear about whether they will truly open source that much. So quite often sometimes the lack of awareness of what should be the right license, even if the intention is correct, prevents people from using that knowledge clear. 
I would only say that the fight between proprietary and open source will continue endlessly. This topic of open sourcing knowledge I'll conclude by uh, quoting one anecdote which happened many years ago. Uh, my friend Vijay Mukhi in, in uh, Mumbai had arranged for a meeting with the great professor Richard Stallman and the industry stalwarts at his home. In fact, in those days, late Shammi Kapoor, who was a great adherent of internet, he was, as many people may not know, but he was the purohit to marry Mr. Vijay Mukhi and Mrs. Vijay Mukhi on internet. Yeah, he, he remembered those days. So I had gone to attend that dinner and there was a very hot conversation between people from IBM, HP and TCS and others with Richard Stallman. They were saying, uh, this is a must and Richard Stallman saying all this bunkum. So I tried to mediate as I usually do and I asked the industry people the following question. I said, the entire India recites shlokas from Gita. So suppose I want to recite say the 14th chapter regularly every morning. What would I feel if I get a letter from some Mr. So and so in Dwarka who says, I am the 583rd descendant of Lord Krishna. The copyright belongs to me. So every time you recite Gita, please arrange to send me 5 rupees. Now, how would you like that? Well, that is copyright. No, 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 you are talking hypothetically. I said, no, I am not talking hypothetically. And please understand that the great societal leaders never try to put a patent or copyright because they believe that whatever they have to say is universally useful and they wanted people to benefit from that. So that is the purpose of open source. Why do you prevent? Why do you object to something being an open source? Well, then I turned to Richard Stallman and I said, Richard, tell me one thing. These are all commercial companies. People have put money in building those companies. Those people who have put money expect these companies to be profitable. And these companies will be profitable only if they exploit the innovation that they do for commercial gains. So if you say every software must be open source, how will they make any commercial gains at all? And Richard Salman coolly says, that is their problem. Then I said, Baba, but that is society's problem. Because if that problem is not solved, they won't exist. If they don't exist, there will be no further innovation and growth in the, in the world that is required. In a, some very curious way, I find this to be the battle of two isms, the capitalism and the communism of old times, you know. Not very easy to resolve. I don't understand those battles very well. But in terms of knowledge sharing, I understand one thing. And my advice to everyone is very simple. Those who wish to do innovations for the sake of exploiting them commercially, Godspeed to them. Let them make, generate enough money so that more innovation can happen. Those who wish to generate knowledge or create knowledge articulation for the benefit of large number of people and wish to donate it in open source, in creative commons or whichever way, again Godspeed to them because they are fulfilling an extraordinary need of the human society to gain knowledge, access to very quality. I think there is no dichotomy here. These are not mutually exclusive things. Both must continue to exist, but they must not argue and fight. And at the points of interfaces, there have to be clear and simple resolution of issues. Last, so this is about open sourcing. I, uh, uh, unfortunately, because of this view of mine, I am curiously hated by both sides. The open source evangelist saying the Fatak is not strong enough. And the industry thinks I am too much of an open source man. But that's the price that you pay whenever you try to take any middle path. The last point I wanted to touch upon was technology. We have seen rapid growth in technology, but just look at the web and look at the shortest possible time in which the web is having extraordinary influence of on human lives. Internet was there. I mean, I, I uh, pride myself in saying that the first email in India was exchanged between Dr. Ramani's lab and my lab in 80s. Okay. Things were happening, things were happening slowly. In the United States, things were happening at very great speed. In fact, you will see all the Turing Award winners, how many of them come from those exciting places 
whether it is Buckley or what, what you, you name the place. Of course, Jim Gray was at multiple places. Uh, what I mean is that the technology changes much faster and the disruptive changes the technology is bringing in human lives do not leave us sufficient time to adjust unless we act quickly. Just to look at the past, it was very obvious that wave will first make a disruptive change in the way businesses are done. And that is very apparent to all of us today, including people in smaller towns. I am not so sure of villages. But the number of Indians who are aware of internet and web has, has increased much more than the number of people who actually use internet regularly. And that number is only bound to increase, that is increasing faster. Transactions happen online. We, most of us, you know, we book our tickets uh, online, etc., etc. The next disruptive change was predicted in education and healthcare. I don't know much about healthcare, but I can see that disruptive change starting to happen in education. It started happening when the number of students submitting their assignments routinely had greater content from the published articles on the web. In IIT Bombay, we noticed it about 10 years ago, and the trend has only increased. There's one uh, uh, lady teacher when I was heading our school of management, she failed uh, 42 of uh, 58 students in one particular course because they had so much uh, component which was very common. These days, just as people develop expertise in copying methodically, there are tools which try to find out if there is something copy. So, of recent times, we use uh, Turnitin, which is a software which finds out the similarity and so on. So, it was applied to my own MTech students and in two cases, the match was 23%. And then it was noticed that all of it was concentrated in the literature survey portion. But in the literature survey, you are not supposed to quote verbatim the literature from somewhere. So, these are the kind of... Uh, 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 you know, things that technology enables it. When PCs came, use of PCs for increasing the effectiveness of education was a great thing. That is the time when the most of e-learning things started coming up. In terms of scaling and education in India, one of the best efforts that I had seen in early days was taken up by Azim Premji Foundation. My friend Dilip Ranjekar was, I think, the key person behind that effort, where they took the PCs to schools in Karnataka, in village schools. And they had an interesting model. I did not speak about it, but I must digress and mention this. Education involves costs. And any cost involves two things. One, revenue stream, and two, financial management. Both of these are related to running a business. Sadly, in India, because the moral high ground that this society has always taken, we always say education must not be made into a business. Okay. How untrue it is, you ask yourself this question, right from the schools to colleges, education is a business. Americans at least are straightforward. They call it a business because they know it is a business. Okay. Even stalwarts like Professor Sukhat may admit that while we must not make education into a business, education must run in a business-like fashion. Because if there is a cost, that cost must be met. And the revenue will come from either tuition fees or in some odd cases, capitation fees or government grants or societal grants. But somehow the costs have to be met. Now, when it comes to the costs, I was referring to this experiment that Azim Premji's uh, foundation did. And they were very clear right from the beginning that unless the stakeholders have put in part of the cost, the project will not succeed. So they had a three-way cost split model. One-third cost was borne by Azim Premji Foundation. One-third cost was met by Karnataka government. And one-third cost was required to be met by local people through Gram Panchayat. In fact, I remember Azim by telling me that the Karnataka government offered to pay two-thirds of the cost. And Dilip Ranjeka said, no, government should not pay two-thirds of the cost. At least some cost must be paid by the people who are involved. Otherwise, they will not own it. And today that project, I mean, quite some time ago, that project went from strength to strength for 2,000 
3,000 schools, etc. It was not just a project of dumping pieces and doing something. They had done a lot of pedagogical studies. They have done controlled experiments. Meaning, they have evaluated students through the similar tests. One group which has undergone training using computers, they did not teach computer programming. They used computers to teach Kannada language, maths and science and such things. So they, they evaluated those students against the same exam that other students were given. And they, proved, they have proven again and again and again that students who are enabled by technology in this manner perform better in all the evaluations. That means the technology distinctly adds values to life. Technology is something that can permit us to scale up because the weaknesses in our academic infrastructure, namely lack of qualified and experienced teachers, can be to a large extent not exactly substituted but can be supported and complemented by using technology. To mention how we use technology, for example, uh, we use uh, a, a blended model of education where we, we train 10,000 teachers at a time, by the way, uh, in specific subjects as per the ICT norms. We assemble these teachers in 250-odd institutions, which we call remote centers. VRC is one of the remote centers. There are three or four remote centers in Pune itself. Uh, we assemble 40, 50, 60 teachers at each of these remote centers. The lectures in a chosen subject are given by the best teacher whom we identify who teaches from IIT Bombay. Morning lectures are interactive lectures, much like you use Webex, we use a tool called AV. In the afternoon, the tutorials and labs are conducted in the remote centers under the supervision of a workshop coordinator. To ensure that the workshop coordinator conducts the labs and tutorials in exactly the same rigorous style as we do in IIT, we collect all these 250 workshop coordinators for one week training at IIT beforehand. It is much like we train our own teaching assistant. Teaching assistants nowadays are PhD students and M.Tech students, but traditionally teaching assistants are also professors. So when I remember when I used to teach uh, programming, my teaching assistant was my own head of the department and two or three senior professors. That is common in IIT system. I had a tough time to explain to some of the participating teachers that I am using the term teaching assistant. They thought it is derogatory. One fellow said, sir, I am a faculty member at this college. So I say, I am also a faculty member, a senior faculty member, but I was teaching assistant to Mr. So-and-so when he was teaching programming, and he was my own student. So there is no problem in being a teaching assistant. Anyway. So this is the rigorous program that we conduct. We have conducted three programs for 10,000 teachers. I was talking about using technology for scaling. We started with 200 teachers in about five remote centers. Then we scaled to 1,000 teachers. We ran about 10 workshops, 1,000 teachers each at 30 to 40 remote centers. Uh, Mr. Kapil Sibyl suggested, can you scale it up? And there was one joint secretary, Mr. Sina, who says, Fatak, attempt for 10,000 teachers. We did that. We ran a course in July, and it was extremely well received. We have run three more programs like that, not fully 10,000, 10,000 is a nomenclature, but about 8,500 uh, teachers in each of these three courses have benefited. So this is a scalable model. And this could not have done, could not have been done without technology. Of course, it is still a costly model. To train one teacher, it cost us 6,400 rupees for a two-week program. But please remember the context. If AICT runs a QIP program, the cost per teacher for a two-week program is typically 14,000 rupees. When we are running 1,000 teacher program, we had brought down the cost to 9,400 rupees. Now we have brought it down to 6,250. And now we propose to bring it down further by introducing a revenue model. Well, we now find that the teachers benefit. So we are asking teachers, will you pay for this course? 6,200 rupees, perhaps a large amount of money, but will, will the college pay for that uh, uh, advantage to the teacher? We hope that it will happen. The moral of this is that a revenue model is a must in anything that we do. The latest in technology is MOOCs, which all of you have heard, massive online open courses. This is not a very old thing. And for the first time, India has a chance actually to catch up with the latest in the world. MOOCs were initially offered by three organizations, Coursera, uh, edX, and Udacity. Most of them celebrated their 
first one year anniversary just few months ago they offer a course from a participating university and that course is available online typically 1 lakh or more participants register all over the globe the entire examination system is online the course is designed exactly first week second week third week like a normal course is all of these are actual courses which are offered in the affiliated units for example from mit the first course to be offered was uh, basic electronics which dr anand agarwal the president of edx himself had offered the first course to be offered from coursera was uh, machine learning which was offered by professor andrew ing who is the promoter of coursera and these courses are actually taken by 1 lakh people how do you do a benefit analysis well the number of people who actually succeeded in getting the certification was only 5 to 7% that means 5 to 7000 students finished that course successful what is the credibility of that evaluation questionable because all the people say that this is called a honor code certification a participant says that i have not used any unfair means to give these tests and based on this statement i am given a certificate based on my scores what is the value in industry we do not know what is the value to the individual depending upon the seriousness and honesty with which that participant has participated in that course that is the value iit bombay has very recently concluded an mou with edx and iit bombay will be the first institute in the country to offer a mooc hopefully by the year and because it takes about 6 months to prepare a course for that mooc but talking about technology that technology permits lakhs of people to simultaneously log in lakhs of people to simultaneously benefit from exactly the same course organization that my students on the campus benefit from today they can undergo very similar evaluation if not identical because our evaluation in a programming course for example will consist of actual program being written now here i remember dr ramani had introduced automatic evaluation of submitted programs that's a well known technique now yeah vijay is here he would he would be aware of it. we can definitely apply that technique and examine the programs that are submitted by students there are some courses which are very easily possible to scale up to 1 lakh and where people will actually benefit and quality education can actually reach people meaningfully to make that quality education reach meaningfully to the students within the precincts of the conventional systems established system well, that is the problem look sam petrola recently suggested a very interesting and important point he says that students who earn credits from these courses should be permitted to earn credits towards their degree at least to the extent of 10 to 15% that means i am a student of coep coep should acknowledge that this course from iit kharagpur or this course from iit madras whatever this mooc course if the students get this grade or marks or whatever those marks will be considered as marks for the corresponding course in coep coep solves one problem if i don't have many uh, teachers available to teach large number of students that particular course well the best teacher is teaching that the entire load is taken up the issue is who will pay the fees for getting this certification currently these mooc courses are offered free of cost but there is has to be a revenue model and the revenue model is in sync with what we have thought always at iit bombay namely knowledge should be free so therefore contents including video lectures are free interaction if you wish will cost some money and certification and assessment will cost a fees which is the well accepted model this technology will progress further in our training teachers we are also using akash tablets to conduct quizzes online this is something which is not feasible in the conventional paper technology you cannot conduct three quizzes in every lecture because you will spend most of the time in conducting quizzes in iit bombay the experiment that we have done permit us to conduct each of these quizzes in exactly 2 minutes but teacher has more work to do the other thing which the technology permits you to do is flipping of the classroom which is people listen to the lectures elsewhere but come to the classroom to discuss problems and tutorial engagements so you basically attend lectures at home and solve problems in the class 
there is normally you attend lectures uh, to listen to the uh, to, to attend classes to listen to the lectures and solve problems at home this flip model was tried at least very seriously in two courses one at iit madras by professor mangal sundar and one at iit bombay by professor kannan mogal and their findings are very interesting what they say is that all the top performing students benefited tremendously but the average and the bottom performing students did not benefit to that extent when a review was taken they all admitted that they actually did not see or listen to that lecture seriously before coming to the class and this brings me to the point that one advantage of assembling 60 people in a classroom is that in spite of the greenery in the through the windows and other things a majority of time i am forced to listen to that lecture in an individual environment that may not happen but these are different things going forward going forward i have no hesitation in in admitting that i believe that the massive online courses will become extremely common and the mainstay of education not only in engineering education but first in higher education and subsequently in school education because this is the only thing that can scale up instead of regular pcs tablets will probably be the overriding technology that people will be using it and i foresee not a 7 inch tablet but a 10 inch kind of tablet to emerge as the major technology component cloud computing will will become the very relevant thing because it is not possible to provide this kind of computing power to handle massive load on single servers located in it bandwidth requirement will only increase at one time i used to be very critical of bsnl when they used to talk about 64 kb pipe the so called 64 kilobit per second pipe between mumbai and delhi used to cost 9.5 lakh rupees annually you will always shock at least the younger ones today routinely at homes you buy 1 mbps or 2 mbps bandwidth at fraction of this cost but let me tell you that all our bandwidth calculations are going to go heavy the requirement is going to increase 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 exponential the colleges which say which used to say we have 4 mbps bandwidth and which now say 32 mbps bandwidth are all grossly mistaken the institutions must immediately start planning for a minimum of 1 gbps bandwidth to every institute the government is planning already the national knowledge network has taken large fibers to every block level this is something which is not very well known but every block panchayat level connectivity at least the bare bone backbone is available and you know the number of fibers which are laid the capacity the bandwidth that is actually likely to be available is 1000 times as much as is perceived to be required in 2020 so that is the national capacity building of course that is raw what you call uh, dark fiber somebody has to exploit it i expect wifi i am told is practically dying but the 4g the last mile using some kind of a wireless connectivity is going to be the major provider of bandwidth so in a nutshell if i talk about technology then i will expect moocs to become the predominant uh, technology platform this is one of the reasons why we decided to tie up with edx is because edx unlike coursera and udacity have open source their technology platform so we'll be working closely with, with them because the idea in india is that we should exploit that platform enhance it customize it and use it for teachers training use it for vocational training use it for school education for variety of purposes and uh, rather than developing the whole platform which may take 2 years and lot of money it is much better to take an established platform and modify it. so that is the direction that we are taking so let me come to my conclusions now i have spoken about five things about learning which as i admitted and thanks again to the organizers i learned a lot about learning because of this lecture about education my contention that the existing systems cannot be completely changed so till we attempt to change them we must work within the 
parameters of the existing system. It is possible if we take the suggestions made by people like Sam Petroda. Uh, <coughs> Dr. Pankaj Jalote has been making this suggestion for quite some time. We have had many discussions in IIT where we, we simply say that let a student get the course grade or uh, marks from any place. We should be able to give credits for that course if we believe that the evaluation and learning has been appropriate. And this kind of migration of course evaluation across universities would make a lot of sense. Scaling, yes, we are attempting, but we need to scale much larger. Please, and I will repeat this again, our requirement of scales are mind-boggling. And whatever we are doing is grossly inadequate as compared to what needs to be done not only till 2020, but even beyond. We have to keep that in mind. I would just like to mention one more thing in this scaling. A whole lot of pilots, I have seen for the last 40 years so many pilots. In fact, I jokingly once said that India is a graveyard of pilots. This was, uh, this I had stated when there was a graveyard of patent tanks at, in one of the wars. I remember, there's so many patent tanks. There are so many pilots. Okay. So here is, I will comment on something on how to run the pilots in my concluding portion. But please remember, we have to go much beyond pilots. I will now conclude by saying just a few points on what must India do. Universities and governments, okay, the government must put in more money, more investment in education in overall sense. It is putting in too less money for the comfort of the nation. The government must ensure that they do not act as benevolent dictatorship. Educational systems, independent of how bad or poorly run they are, must be completely autonomous. If they are not, there is a great danger that proper education will not happen. Universities should try and come out of this ethos of syllabus and exam kind of thing. Affiliated universities, uh, rather affiliating universities with 400 engineering colleges, 300 engineering colleges, etc., etc., and factories which award degrees, they are very indistinguishable. Now, that is a very sad comment to make. It's a very strong statement to make. But I make it by design because I feel very sad. Universities should be, you know, universities are places where learning and enhancement of knowledge happens. Where each individual is treated with the dignity of a learner and is given sufficient opportunity to learn. It is not a kind of factory thing. It's the evaluation and assessment and degree giving requirement which is causing problem. Just consider the following. Why are university degrees important? Because students take them seriously. Why students take them seriously? Because they believe that they will get good jobs. Here is a take. Suppose Tata Consultancy Service says, I don't care whether you have an engineering degree or not. I will evaluate you independently for your programming skills and your other attendant knowledge. And I'll give you a job. Will I care for my degree? Will I care for my marks? If all the entire industry does this, if the society says, I don't care for your degree or marks, but I have the capability of independently evaluating you and assessing you in terms of the knowledge that I require you to have to do this job. What will happen to the universities? I tell you, the entire arrogance of the university system is based on the fact that industry and society tremendously values these degrees and marks. If nothing else, they work at least as a basic filtration process for them. The day the industry discovers that they have ability to independently assess a person quickly, quickly is the key point. They will not give one hood to the degrees. And the technology which permits lakhs of students to study simultaneously will also permit industry to evaluate lakhs of people simultaneously. The day is not far off. Please remember, the web does not change things in 50 years or 100 years. It changes things in two years, three years, and four years. So to the university and government, I will say, 
please don't wait for the events to overtake you please anticipate events and redefine what all you can do best to enhance the fundamental of learning and teaching that is your primary job to the teachers i have nothing much to add there are many occasions when i have said so many things but i'll i'll say only one point please redefine and recalibrate your role in your own mind please do not ever say i am a teacher and my job is to teach please always say i am a teacher and my job is to ensure that every learner learns maximally in my class that should be the definition of the teacher's role to the professionals i will say that many people particularly the younger professionals who have finished their education in just about last one or two years they are in the profession they wrongly believe that because they have come out of an educational system their education has ended that is incorrect they have tremendous responsibility to keep learning albeit they will have to learn in a different environment they are the ones who should be using future moocs maximally to enhance and to make their knowledge better but there is another role that the professionals have to pay play they have to become mentors and teachers so suppose i am a professional who is 10 years old in an organization i have learned a lot i have struggled hard even as a professional i have learned something what i forget is that the youngsters who are joining my organization still need teachers in the conventional sense but they have left the education system they have joined as as my younger colleagues here who will teach them till such time that they learn to teach themselves they need mentoring and the professionals must provide this role as a part of their duty as a part of their charter if they don't do that then they will be failing to help their own organization to grow their own success will be defined by how well their younger associates work for them and they can work better if they provide this mentor to the parents i would like to say rethink on your priorities there is a bhed chal that is happening today every parent wants get admission to engineering college so first choice engineering college within the engineering college first choice computer science it happens at all levels the best and the most talented student we pride in iit bombay that more than top 75 out of the top 100 students passing je every year consistently for several years they want to join computer science program at iit bombay is our computer science program so great we would like to believe so but there is no reason to believe that the computer science program at iit kharagpur or iit kanpur or iit madras is any less i know personally all the teachers there i know personally all the students there there is no reason to believe that the computer science program at coep or vnit is any less again i know all the teachers there and i know all the students there it's a perception that if you get a degree from iit bombay the greatest possible jobs you will get please understand that the majority of the students want jobs they don't want to do research now given this perception the parents force their students to do uncanny things this quota factory where two years you send your children to work for preparing for je you are making them lose two years of their beautiful childhood where they could have learned so many more things in life i wonder whether any any child who is interested in poetry ever reads two poems in the two years of the quota work or any games that the student is good at playing ever plays for those two years and they learn cheating they learn cheating because they also have to give their exams or 11th and 12th standard for which they are required to give attendance in koyamtur or jarsukula or wherever and their attendance is marked in quota parents are encouraging their wards to become cheaters of the first kind please watch my words i am very serious about this at the younger age there is another thing that you see here english medium schools every parent wants the children to go into english medium schools and this is not limited to cities in small places in cities people from the worst of economic conditions would pay any amount of money to get their children admitted to english speaking schools what are the problems there the 
teaching is in english at home i speak to child in marathi because i don't know how to speak english believe me the child learns much less the best education the primary level always happens in mother tongue it is well established statistically universal but no that's not true i can understand a set of parents where they actually converse in english at home and they can converse in english with the children but that that number is very small i sometimes wonder where we are still an independent nation i am very proud to say that i have not seen a foreign flag fluttering over my head but i see a foreign language not just fluttering over my head but is inundating the entire society there is nothing wrong with english language but what is wrong is our forgetting that our own mother tongue our own national language needs to be used because it is more effective in certain cases than any other form and to the students i give my most favorite message they do three things in life number 1 dream big because with small dreams your achievements will be limited number 2 enjoy life because every moment comes only once in your life but when i say enjoy life it does not mean see movies and play games alone enjoy working enjoy solving hard problems enjoy discussions enjoy everything that and last work hard because unless you work hard your achievements will again be limited so dream big enjoy life and work hard and then your life will be as beautiful as those dew drops the initials of the word dew define what i suggest you to do dream big enjoy life and work hard to the universities and government to the teachers to the professionals and parents and to the students collectively i would like to say this there are 300 million indians younger than all of us sitting here and sitting in other halls 300 million they are as big as the entire population of united states and other large country they are all waiting for us to do something for them they will hold us responsible when the history is written in future and if the history has to say that we lacked this enrollment rolls or we did not use technology properly or we did not change the system properly the people will have to take the blame will be us most of you represent the leading edge of the demographic advantage people who are in the age group of 25 to 35 25 to 40 are the effective leaders of this nation and i would like to charter them with this single point agenda independent of any addition to whatever you do for your own profession because that is your prime objective in life you must do well in life you must become rich you must build wealth you must build technology you must do whatever but while doing that you must think of making some contribution and that contribution better be in terms of directly or indirectly making life more meaningful in terms of better learning and better education to 300 million indians who are all waiting for you and me to do something about that thank you so much god bless you.